Let's look at competition and cooperation. First of all, competition. When we think of competition in the creative industries, we instantly think of those businesses that are um, in direct competition with each other because they're selling the same things, whether it's um, videos or apps or uh, performances, whatever it might be, they're selling basically the same thing. And so they are competitors. But that's just one aspect of competition. Um, and I'm referring to Michael Porter's um, five forces of competition. And he spells out these five, the first of which is simply rivalry. And that's what we describe and that's what we often think of as competition and we think that only that is competition. The rivalry, the jockeying for position amongst rivals in the marketplace, selling the same things, uh, trying to get to the customer first. And that's one force of competition, clearly, but it's by no means the whole story. The second um, is the threat of new entrants. And this is particularly pertinent, I think, in the creative industries, because you might think that Okay, we don't have many competition, you know, many competitors or rivals in our city, or our town, or in what we do. But who's to say that there won't be in the future? And actually, the barriers to entry in many aspects of the creative industries are very low. In other words, anybody can set up as a rival, whether it's you know graphic design I'm thinking of, or uh, web website design, making videos whatever it might be, you know, what is there to stop other people setting up uh, if the market becomes very, um, you know, very profitable, then other people will come in and we can't stop them. So we need to be aware of that um, force of competition, the threat of new entrants, and think ahead strategically about how we can deal with this competition. And we'll talk about that in, you know, in other videos. The third aspect of or force of competition is the threat of substitute products. And, you know, going back in history, there are so many examples of, of these. One is uh, typewriters. Perhaps many of you are too young to remember typewriters, but there were different typewriter companies and they were competing with each other as rivals. But the main threat of competition for all of them wasn't the other typewriter manufacturer down the road who had a more stylish or more efficient typewriter, the real threat came from word processors. When, you know, simple computers started to be available to the consumer market uh, offering word processing. This wasn't a better kind of typewriter, it was a substitute product. And that's where the real threat came from. And that's why nowadays, you know, there are probably no or uh, very few typewriter companies left and typewriters are you know museum curiosities not a practical way we use to you know to type words and you know again more connected to the creative industries is Kodak you know which was the you know predominant international seller of film for cameras um, they were the world leaders their name was synonymous with photography the threat to them didn't come from a better um, filmmaker, but from digital photography, from Japanese companies who were, you know, expert in computers who moved into ph photography um, and digital photography in particular. And that's where the threat came from, you know, and that was the real competitive threat to Kodak, not somebody who was like them doing a better job than them but somebody who came from from left field from a different direction and that's what blew them out of the water the fourth um, force of competition is the bargaining power of suppliers you know as markets change and economies and economics changes then you know sometimes suppliers can become much more powerful and this changes the whole structure of competition in the wider marketplace. 
And I'm talking here about monopolies or near monopolies or situations in which uh, suppliers can start to move towards monopoly and you know uh, restrict the availability of their product. This happens in the physical environment with, with particular physical products, but also in services and professional associations and even trade unions are part of this. They can actually you know, restrict supply to a market and therefore have more bargaining power and this affects competition in a wider sense. And fifthly, um, the fifth of Michael Porter's forces of competition is the bargaining power of buyers. And so sometimes as structural changes happen in the economy, buyers can become much more, um, much more powerful and this affects competition and all kinds of things within business. And I remember, you know, very vividly from my days of working in book distribution and marketing, when we were supplying our publishers books to bookshops. And when we began doing that, bookshops were mainly independent bookshops all over the country and internationally. And we would be able to sell them um, our books our books with just a 35% discount on the retail price and that was the profit margin they made 35% but then structural changes happened and instead of there being lots of independent books bookshops there were these big chains like Waterstones in the UK where I was operating mainly and uh, Barnes and Noble in the United States etc so these book chains collectively well in, an individual book chain was now buying on behalf of many many bookshops and so they had fantastic bargaining power and they came to us and said 35% isn't good enough you have to give us 45% discount um, we demand that and if you don't want to play ball then we won't buy from you they were extremely powerful and 45% went to 55% which was very painful for us so our you know, th this was how competition affected us, not just the rivals of other people in our position selling books to the same bookshops, but the power of the bookshops themselves when they became chains, recognised they had more power to negotiate bigger discounts, and indeed they did that. So there, those are Michael Porter's five forces of competition, but I'm wondering now whether there's a sixth which you might call the power of intermediaries, who are not exactly suppliers, uh, not exactly buyers, but these intermediaries. And I'm thinking of those big, you know, mega corporations that are very prominent nowadays, such as Amazon. You know, the power of Amazon is incredible. They provide a service, they capture more market share, this, they're they're a distributor on behalf of other manufacturers of goods and services, but they're also a manufacturer themselves. So it's a much more complicated picture, but they are intermediaries of great power. And the same would go for Google um, and Apple with the App Store, where they are the, the means by which app developers get to the market. And so, you know, the power of of Apple is incredible. We can't really ignore them if we want to distribute our apps or the you know the Google uh, store either. And so they have a lot of power and this changes the position for um, producers in the creative industries. So competition is very complex actually. It's not just about the rivals jockeying for position, the people doing the same as you. It's a much wider picture and we need to take that into account when we're developing and operating our business strategies. And then secondly, I'd like to talk about co-opetition. This is a hybrid word. It's a, it's a combination of cooperation and competition. It's a paradox. You know, these two words are almost the opposite. You know, there's cooperation, which is nice and friendly, um, but Competition implies fighting or conflict. But 
cooperation exists as a concept because there are times in which we can, for our mutual benefit, co cooperate or collaborate with our competitors. And one example that I've written about is about two art galleries in Vietnam, in Ho Chi Minh City. These two art galleries on the same street were rivals. They were competing for the tourist dollar. You know, as, as uh, tourists walked down the street, they were calling them into one gallery or another. They were competitors, rivals. But they came to realize that if they looked at the bigger picture, they could collaborate to put both of their galleries' paintings online and then reach a much wider market than the tourists who arrived in their street. They could actually sell um, nationwide and internationally. So they decided to collaborate to set up a website called Vietnam Artist through which they sold the paintings from both of their galleries. And in that sense, you know, they collaborated for mutual benefit. They created a bigger market. And although, you know, they, they were competing within that, you might say, um, they were each wanted the, the biggest slice of the pie, so to speak. The pie was now much, much bigger. So they were both benefiting by reaching a wider market, by putting their galleries online in a collaborative venture. Uh, for the sake of both of them. So sometimes it's not often and certainly not a general rule, but there are particular circumstances in which it benefits everybody for competitors or rivals to collaborate or cooperate. And that's what I mean by co-opetition.